like this forever.
Father, we thank you. We love you. We adore you. You are such a compassionate Father. Your grace and your mercy continues to cover our lives. We thank you for being who you are in ours. Thank you for this pastor, for this people. Thank you for all that you have done with, through, and in them over the years. Thank you for this place where we can come and learn and grow and be encouraged and inspired in your word. And I ask now, God, that you would help me to preach your word today. Give me preaching power. In Christ's name we do pray. Come on, clap your hands and say amen. Amen. Can you help me celebrate your pastor, your first family? Bishop Maceo Smith, Lady Patrice Smith, they are our family, our brother and our sister, and we love you. Amen. We love them. They are such beautiful people. You all have been blessed with their leadership and their presence. And every chance you get, you ought to just tell them how much of a blessing they've been in your life. How they help you grow in your relationship with God. I am not by myself. My wife and my daughter is here with me. Latron is here. And baby Kinsley, she's bringing up the Rhea. I promise she's the last of the Mohicans. I promise you she is bringing up the Rhea, and I'm grateful uh, for their presence. This, this, this praise and worship is amazing. And I want you to know it's not like this everywhere. And don't ever take for granted the atmosphere, the oil, the presence, the power of God that rests in this place because it's not like this everywhere. I ask your prayers as we go to Psalm 34 today. Verse number one. It's a familiar passage of scripture. It simply says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Again, the verse says, I will bless the Lord at all times, and his praise shall continually be in my mouth. On your way to your seat, just look at three people and tell them, even when everything goes wrong, even when everything goes wrong, Amen. You may take your seat. I don't know about you, City of Joy, but it seems like, at least for me, over the last few years, if it's not one thing, it's another. I can stand here and testify that even in my own life, I have experienced gut-wrenching realities that if it had not been for God on my side, I really don't know where I would be. And I believe that if we took the time to pass a microphone throughout this room, we would be able to gather a sense and a survey of those who can speak for themselves. If you feel like that you have gone from the frying pan right into the fire. And the truth of the matter is, it's only a miracle that you even have just a mustard seed of faith left. Because sometimes the real struggle in life is not trying to make sense of what the devil is doing, but trying to make sense of what God is allowing. Because we love God, but the truth of the matter is we don't always agree with God. And what I have learned, ladies and gentlemen, is that in order to maintain my faith, I sometimes have to accept what I don't agree with. Some of us didn't realize how strong we were until life pushed us to the edge. And it was when life blindsided us that we found out that Jesus is, in fact, a rock 
in a weary land, shelter in the time of storm. The psalm writer of this particular text is King David. He writes this text as he begins to reminisce on a time gone by in his life. He writes this psalm, ladies and gentlemen, after, sometimes after he was captured by the Philistines in a town called Gath. And for some reason, he keeps going back to this moment in his life. It is that moment in his life that he has on his mind when he writes Psalm 34. By the time David writes this psalm, he's already killed the giant in battle. He's already killed Goliath with a shot in the head. He has already killed him not with a slingshot, but with a slingshot. What he killed Goliath with was not a toy, but a military weapon. And some folk, the reason why they don't like you, because they can't play with you. They thought you were a toy. Didn't realize you were a weapon. So for some reason, we think that David is an underdog, and we thought he was an underdog when he fought Goliath because we thought he had a toy. He didn't have a toy. He did not have a slingshot. He had a slingshot, which means, ladies and gentlemen, that when David killed Goliath, he had a military-grade weapon in his hand, that as he was swinging it and with momentum... You need to understand that David was not the underdog Goliath was. Because what Goliath wanted to do was to bang shields with David. He wanted to wrestle with David. He wanted hand-to-hand -hand combat with David. He did not think that David would bring a gun to a knife fight. And already I'm preaching to somebody because folk want you to get down in the weeds with them. They... They want you to argue with them. They want you to go back and forth with them. They had no idea that you were a killer sent by God. And I'm trying to tell somebody in here that the reason why you can give God the glory is because God allowed you to kill at a distance what was trying to bring you in close. So by the time David kills Goliath, you understand that it was not even David's fight. His brothers were there. His brothers too scared to fight, but David fought. And somebody, I want you to know, you don't play about your family. Look at somebody on your road and tell them, I don't play about my family. I don't play no games about my family. Now, what's interesting, ladies and gentlemen, is that when, when David killed Goliath, it meant one thing for David, but it meant another thing for Saul because it brought up in Saul a spirit of jealousy and animosity. There are some people who are jealous of you. They are not jealous of your accomplishment. They are jealous of your anointing. They are jealous of what God decided to do in your life. And what they don't realize is you didn't even ask God to do it for you. But because God chose you instead of them, they've got something to say. Here's what I'm trying to get you to understand 10 minutes into the sermon is that you can explain other people's behavior. You can predict other people's behavior. You can influence other people's behavior. But you can only control your own behavior. And all I'm saying to you is don't let somebody mess up your day. Don't let somebody rob you of your joy. Please don't let their behavior become your heart attack. Because you can't control them. You only can control yourself. What might make you cry ought not ever make you quit. Saul then chases David from one end of the kingdom to the other, threw spears at him, plotted to kill him, sent gangsters to try to wipe him out in the middle of the night. And this now we come to understand as David's failure in his own faith. There were times when David was caught in his own head and his faith failed him because he was going through trials and tribulations and hard times. And we understand that when we look at Psalm 34, that is the moment. Look at how it is headed. It says, 
Psalm 34, a psalm when David changed his behavior before Ahimelech. It's when he was on the run from Saul. And when he was on the run from Saul, he ran into Goliath's old town. He ran into the town where he killed the giant. And he's on the run from Saul. Saul is the king of Israel. Saul is jealous of him. He can't control Saul's behavior. So he runs and ends up in the same town of the giant he killed by the name of Gath. And uh, when he gets there, they began to sing and celebrate him. They begin to talk about how much of a mighty warrior he is and how skilled he is in battle and how masterful he is. And David is one who is anointed. And David understands he can survey the landscape of the people and understand this is not the time for me to be celebrated. This is not the time for me to be honored. This is not the time for my banquet and my plaque. This is the time for me to bowl low key. This is the time for me to go under the radar. You've got to have enough God in you to understand now is not the time for me to be in the spotlight. Now is not the time for me to be celebrated because right now I got too many haters around me right about now and what I'm trying to do is just live to the next season of my life y'all know the story and so what David does is David starts acting crazy you know shaking his head and foaming at the mouth and falling out and because he acts so crazy the king says ain't no way he's a mighty man he's somebody who has lost his mind and instead of trying to kill David they let David go and they let him go because he let five minutes of crazy have its moment in the sun can I tell you why praise and worship is so important because every now and then you've got to let five minutes of crazy just have its moment in the sun because you had no idea how the enemy was plotting and planning and trying to take you out but there was a God who still sits high and still looks low and I wonder am I preaching to 25 people in here who can give God the glory because you know there was a time when you could have lost it all it's that, it's that season in his life it's that moment in his life that David is thinking about when he writes Psalm 34 it's that moment when he begins to reflect back of how it could have been, how it would have been, how it should have been if it had not been for God on his side. He's reflecting. He's thinking back. Years have gone by. He's thinking back to when he killed Goliath and had to run from Saul and was in a bad situation and had to act crazy just to get out of it, had to change his behavior. Some of y'all ain't never been there because some of y'all been in church your whole life, but 30 of you, I can tell by the way your eyebrows sit on your forehead, you know what it means to try to act way, try to act a certain way just to get out of a thing. That really ain't you, but you you had to act a certain way just to get out of what you were in. David wasn't crazy. He was just acting crazy. And some of y'all in here, the reason why you owe God a praise is because even when your behavior changed, your God never did. The reason why you should be popping up like popcorn is because when you acted like you didn't have no home training, when you acted like you didn't know God, when you acted like you didn't feel like you you were going to serve him. God kept waking you up in the morning. God kept putting food on your table. God kept, man, am I preaching to anybody in here who can just clap your hands and shout, keep on preaching? It's that moment in his life where he starts to reflect on what God has already done. And I wonder what you're going to do. I wonder what you're going to write. I wonder what you're going to start working on. When you start reflecting, <laughs> when you start thinking back to what God, what books will come out of your belly? Because you started thinking about what God did 10 years ago. What 
businesses will come out of your being because you started remembering what God brought. What visions will God birth in you 10 years from now because of what you're going through right now? It is because of David's history. It's because of his past. It's because of his pain that he says, I will bless the Lord at all times and his praise will continually be in my mouth. Now, these verses are a commitment to praise God. It's to honor God in all situations. And to be honest, Bishop Smith, these particular words of David in this first uh, verse of Psalm 34 are quite intimidating. It's hard if you really think about it. These are some words that are not easy to live up, to bless the Lord at all times. It means to honor God in every situation, even the troubling ones. That's kind of intimidating if you think about it. Sometimes it's hard to pursue your relationship with God. Sometimes it's hard to position your heart for worship when things get too heavy and suffering is too severe and the highs are too high and the lows are too low. Sometimes it's hard to see what God is up to because you're crying too many tears in the midnight hours. The verse make us ask the question, what makes our relationship with God work? Because if David can say, I will bless the Lord at all times, not just in the good times, not just in the happy moments, but what motivates you to praise God when it looks like and it feels like everything is falling apart? How do you praise God when you don't feel like praising God? When your behavior has changed and you're trying to get out of something you should not have even been in to begin with the right writer said, I will bless the Lord at all times. Praise is a motivator and praise needs a motivator. And some of us, we understand that the devil has a strategic plan. Touch your neighbor and tell your neighbor he has a strategic plan. The enemy, listen to me good, the enemy is not after your family. He's just using your family. The enemy is not after your finances. He's just using your finances. The enemy is not even after your future. He's just trying to make you doubt it. What the enemy really wants to do is to crush your faith. Because if he can crush your faith, he will make you give up on God. And if you give up on God, you'll give up on your praise. The enemy knows how to use our unmet expectations, our insecurities our pride, our free will, our unforgiveness, things that we keep holding on to to make us doubt what God is up to in our life. And David, ladies and gentlemen, he is living proof. He knew what it meant to be broken. He knew what it meant to be crushed. He knew what it meant to be loved and lifted by God. And I don't know where you are in this room, but every day has not been kind to you. But you've managed to keep on smiling. People have have twisted your words, tried to be funny on the sly, found something wrong with what you like, but this is what you found out. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy coming in the morning. You found out that even when you fall, God is God at the bottom of life. And here is the question I want to raise for you. What makes God God for you? How is God God for you? Is it because he supplies every need and hears every prayer and pities every groan and heals all of your sicknesses and raises the dead, sets the captives free, food on your table, clothes on your back, forgives your sins, defends you when you will weak courage for the strong, restores the disease, rewards the diligent and the faithful. Can't live without him and you can't outlive him. He is the bright and morning star, lily in the valley. Can't nobody do me like Jesus and can't nobody do me like the Lord. What makes God God for you? That's a real question. Why is God God for you? Is it because he can make something out of nothing? 
Is it because he loved you when you were unlovable? Is it because his thoughts are greater than yours and his ways are higher than yours? Is it because people change and fashions change and conditions change and seasons change, but God never changes? Is it because he knows you better than you know yourself? Is God a verb or is God a noun? Is God a God for you because he remembers or is it? That he never forgets. Which one is it? Is God 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 for you? Because he's the first and the last. What makes God God for you? Because you got to know him for yourself. You can't make it on mama's testimony. On daddy's testimony. On the preacher's testimony. You got to know God for yourself. And I wonder, am I preaching to somebody in here who can give your neighbor a high five and tell your neighbor, I know God for myself. Writer says, writer David says, he will praise God. He will bless the Lord. I'm in verse 4. He said, I'm going to praise him because I sought the Lord and he heard me and he delivered me from all of my fears. David had to think about it, y'all. His praise was an intelligent praise. You got to be a thinking shouter. When you shout, you got to know what you're shouting about. You got to be an intelligent worshiper. David said, I praise him because I have had time to think. I have thought about the prayers he has answered and the ways he has made. I have thought about the failures of my life. I have thought about when I was disappointed and discouraged and rejected and ridiculed and afraid and counted out. But God kept picking me up and turning me around and planting my feet on solid ground. I wonder, do I have somebody in here who has the testimony, can't nobody do me like Jesus and can't nobody do me like the Lord. Oh, come on, clap your hands in here. He said, I understand why, why I praise God. And you've got to understand why you praise God. Because trials will come. Temptations will come. The ebbs and flows and the contours of living all are mixed with burdens and blessings. And you've got to figure out as you mature in God, why do I shout the way I do? I ain't going to expect my neighbor to understand it, but I need to know. Because they were not there when I had to cry myself to sleep at night. I was. They were not there. When I was laid up in a hospital bed, I was. They were not there going back and forth to courtrooms with a child who act like somebody else raised them, but I was. And when I think about the goodness of Jesus and all he has done for me, my soul shouts hallelujah. Oh, give your neighbor a high five and tell your neighbor you don't know like I know what the Lord has done for me. One writer put it like this. He said, pain, pain is inevitable, but misery is optional. I'll say it again. Pain is inevitable. You're going to go through something. I promise you, pain is inevitable, but misery is always optional. You've got to understand that I might be hurting, but I ain't never miserable. I might be sad, but I ain't never going to be miserable. I might be down and out, but I know there's a God above my head. And if I call on the name of Jesus, he will come and see about me. I dare you to open up your mouth and just shout, Jesus, come and see about me. Oh, clap your hands if you are a praiser in here. David said, I know why I praise him. And I'm asking you, what are your reasons? Why do you praise God the way you praise God? What makes God God for you? Because you can't go off the person beside your testimony. Some of us, we praise God because we've thought about to the storms that God delivered us from. Some of us praise God because every storm we've ever been in, we watched it run out of rain. That's why we praise God. Some of us praise God because of the things that God has given us. We praise God for the car we drive because we remember we didn't have reliable transportation. Some of us praise God for the house we live in because we remember growing up in a house that was too small. We had to sleep in the living room and sleep in the dining room. And we thank God for a few 
bedrooms down the hallway. Some of us praise God because he healed us physically. We remember doctors cutting us open and stitching us back together. Some of us praise God because we realize his mercy does endure forever. Some of us praise God because we know we were toe up from the flow up, but we don't look like what we've been through. And I want to know, am I preaching to somebody in here who can give God the glory? Not because what he's doing in 2023, but you had a flashback of what God did in 2018 and 2019 and 2020 and 2021 and 2022. There is no secret to what God can do. What he's done for others, he can do the same for you. Oh, shake somebody's hand and tell your neighbor, affirm your praise. David said, I will, I will, I will, I, I will, I will bless the Lord. He said, I will bless the Lord, which means I'm going to praise him when I feel like it and praise him when I don't. And I'll I'll shout every Sunday if I need to because I know I cannot allow what I'm going through to rob me of my celebration with God. Can I tell you why you need Sunday morning? You need Sunday morning because this is probably the only day of the week where your mind is not consumed about everything that's wrong with your life. This is probably the only day of the week where your thoughts are not self-centered because Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, you were worried about what they were saying on your job. You were worried about your child acting crazy. All week long, you were worried about bills and running errands. But it's something about Sunday morning when you can come in the house of God and lift up your hands and give God the glory. And if you praise God, long enough. Uh, you'll mess around and forget your have problems. Uh, do I have some help in here? You came in one way but you leave out another way uh, because when you start thinking about all that God has done in your life and you start running down the road uh, of how God good to you and you start reflecting on uh, where God brought you from uh, you forget about what you're in right now shake somebody's hand and tell them I need I need Sunday morning I will bless the Lord at all times and his praises will continually be in my mouth he said in verse number four I'm gonna praise him cuz he freed me from my fears verse six he says I'm gonna praise him cuz he delivered me from my trouble I'm gonna praise him verse seven because he protected me I'm gonna praise him in verse 8 because he showed me kindness. I'm going to praise him in verse 9 because he supplied my need. I'm going to praise him in verse 15 because he keeps on listening to me. I'm going to praise him in verse 22 because when I was down, God picked me back up. Do I have somebody who can stand on your feet and shake somebody's hand? Because you woke up this morning with your mind stayed on Jesus. You ought to open up your mouth. David said, I will bless the Lord at all times. And his praise shall be in my mouth. In other words, God has been too good for me to be quiet. God has been too good for me to keep silent. God has been too good for me to act like he's not done anything for me. But when I think about the goodness of Jesus, I got to open up my mouth. Do I have some help in here? If he's healed you, open up your mouth. If he protected you, open up your mouth. If he delivered you, open up your mouth. If he sustained, open up your mouth. 
If you still got a job, open up your mouth. If you still got a car, open up your mouth. If your child is still alive, open up your mouth. This joy that I have, the world didn't give it to me. And the world can't take it away. Shake somebody's hand. Tell them after all I've been through, I still got my joy. After all I've been through, I still got a hallelujah. After all I've been through, this joy that I have, the world didn't give it, and the world can't take it away. Shake somebody's hand, tell them I will bless the Lord. Y'all ain't talking to nobody. I said shake their hand, tell them I will bless the Lord. Y'all ain't talking to nobody. Pull them out of their seats. Shake them and rock them. Rock them and shake them. I will bless the Lord at all times. Say it. Say it. Say it. Oh, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Lord. I'll praise him when I'm up. I'll praise him. When I'm down, I'll praise him when I'm happy. I'll praise him when I'm sad. I'll praise him if I got money. I'll praise him if I'm broke. Because I got one reason why I'm going to praise him. I'm still alive. Shake somebody's hand. Tell him I'm still alive. I will bless the Lord because I'm still alive. I'm still alive, been to hell and back, but I'm still alive, cried, but I'm still alive, hospital, but I'm still alive, lost my job, didn't lose my joy, still alive, I will bless the Lord at all times, and his praise shall be in my mind. The Lord with me, and in God, His name. Open up your mouth and give God a shout. Give Him a praise. I can't hear no. Like this. <laughs> 